Welcome, everyone. Um, as we were saying in the pre-show banter, this is the first time I'm trying to do one of these. Uh, looking forward to it. It's a little exciting. And, um, you know, Craig had tweeted out about a month ago, hey, can someone do a, an hour show on fireworks? And I responded to him right away. I can do it in about 10 or 15 minutes. And he said, you're on, stretch it out. And so <laughs> here we are. We've been working on this for a few days, getting things together. We're going to try some demos for you today. And uh, we'll see how it all goes. So when shooting fireworks, there's really three big considerations. Um, as in most things in photography, there's your location, location, location. Um, there's a quote from Ansel Adams that says, knowing where to stand makes, makes a great photo. And it's, it's finding the place you want to be. You want to scout a location. Um, you want to scout the location if you can in daytime or nighttime. Uh, during the day, you can go out and you can see if there's clutter around, uh, wires, uh, telephone poles, uh, lamp posts. Uh, things that are get, get in the way that you won't really notice at night until they block out part of your fireworks. So see if you can scout a location in advance and know what's going on there. Um, then we're going to talk about stability, uh, getting the camera stable so you can get sharp images. And then we'll talk about the exposure system problems and how to expose for your fireworks. So let's get started with that location stuff and feel free to jump in with questions at any time. Uh, so he's saying scout ahead, uh, get a feeling for the location, uh, especially if you're in an urban area, you may want to look for landmarks or buildings that are going to be in the background, distinctive looking buildings. Um, as you can see in the photo here, some of the background does read, and here I've got some people in the foreground, it just gives a little interest. Uh, it's, it sets a place and a storyline for your, for your images. Uh, so I said, look for landmarks. Here in Seattle, we have the Space Needle. We can try to work into shots, or there's some bridges by the lakes where we shoot the fireworks off. Um, they make all great establishing shots and really give you a sense of place instead of just having close-ups of the fireworks. <clears throat> Watch for clutter. Um, while you're shooting, you're probably not noticing the overhead wires, the telephone poles, lamp posts, uh, things that are going to show up in the shot later. So that's why I say try to get there early while there's still light so you can see if these things are going to be in your shot. Yes, Susan. John, I have a question. OK. Um, what percentage of the time do you think people go out and buy expensive fireworks? What percentage of the time do you think those end up in trees? The fireworks end up in yeah. trees? I mean, do you? <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. I'm not on the side of shooting fireworks. Um, so I, I used to be involved here in Seattle in a fire circus uh, where we, we shot off fireworks on the ground while people danced around them, usually in silver suits and all. And, um, wow. That was the old days of Seattle. A fire circus, a fire huh? circus called Cirque de Flambe. Uh, <laughs> Cirque de Flambe, I love it. <laughs> a lot it. of clowns setting each other on fire and shooting things at each other, Roman candle fights and the like. So that's how I really got involved with fireworks. And, Wow, but, maybe at the end of the class you can talk about how to fire, how to photograph that. <laughs> it's <laughs> very similar. So, um, All right, well, I was just curious because... Yeah, you know. so watch for clutter. Uh, know the wind direction if you can. Uh, it's really uncomfortable to be downwind of a big fireworks show and all the smoke blowing towards you. you know, so if you know the wind is blowing from north to south, try to stay on the north side of the fireworks or to the east or west and get, get so there's a crosswind. Um, you may want to do your wider shots first before a lot of smoke builds up. Uh, a lot of smoke will build up during a big fireworks show. Um, if it's a windy day, it'll get out of the way pretty quickly. But uh, if it's a pretty still night, the, the fireworks are going to end up in a big ball of smoke. After you've got your location shot here, we have some samples that were sent in to, from our viewers out there. I uh, just wanted to show what happens when you have um, some objects in the shot. Here we have laser heart shot, which has this great sky, uh, great color. You know, we so often we see fireworks on black. Uh, looks like it was taken a little earlier in the evening. Uh, it's a really nice effect having the sky there. And but what you see here, we have this large, looks like a lamp post and a flag post in here. Um, you know, just be, be aware that they're there and be ready to deal with them. I mean, it's fine to have them in your composition as long as you know it's there and it's intentional. You know, you just hate to be looking at your images the next day and realize, oh, where did that come from? Um, here, Manic Rathi has these shots where I think the telephone poles 
kind of add to it. You've got this excitement of these explosions in the background, and it kind of ties it to something and, and starts building a story. You know, anything that in there that's going to make you qu ask questions and bring the viewer in. Yes. I have a question. Okay. This is from T. Donald P. Who would like uh -huh. to know how would you set up to show a building clearly in the foreground with the fireworks in the night sky? Clearly in the foreground is probably going to be an issue. It's most likely going to be a silhouette of, of something that's in the foreground. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about lighting in a little bit here if, once we go past these here. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, here, these are from Dan Stock here in Seattle. Uh, during the pre-show banner, we mentioned New Year's Eve fireworks, and the, um, the Space Needle actually shoots fireworks off from, from the Space Needle on, on New Year's Eve here. So it really gives you a sense of place that the Space Needle becomes part of the, the scene here. Those are and, amazing shots. Yeah, and Dan Stock works for one of the, the local news agencies here and gets to go up on the helicopter pad that's right near the Space Needle and has this unobstructed view. Aha, uh -huh. um, so that makes sense. If, so if you hear a helicopter <laughs> zooming in during, during the shot here, during the class here, or during any of the other classes, you know, we're, we're right near the Space Needle, too. The old, right, the so old helicopter shot. Yeah, yeah. location, yeah. location, These location. These are actually <laughs> shot from the helicopter pad, not from a helicopter. Oh, but, wow. But he has that, that access. So thanks, Dan, for sending this to us. Uh, here we can have a couple images from Hector Perez Portillo. I hope that I'm saying that right. And he's mixed this old world looking scene here with the fireworks. I think it's really done effectively. Really nice images here. Um, as we see in this second image here of the church, there, there's a number of wires here. And you can look at it a number of ways. I mean, the wires to me sort of like these crisscrossing dark uh, fireworks or something in there. You know, sometimes there's just no way around the, 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 the wires and the poles in the shot, so use them to your best advantage if, you, if they're there. Uh, but these, I think, were two great shots mixing fireworks in Old World. So, John, I know we're going to talk about lighting later, but uh, yeah. kind of similar to the question that Susan asked, uh, Sam Cox is asking, do you ever use flash low power to bring out some foreground detail? No, um, I usually don't use flash at all, and that, that is on a slide in here, but um, there is probably a situation where you may want to, and we are going to cover that in a little bit. Um, here we've got a couple of shots that were sent in by AWB Photo, uh, showing the overall scene, uh, you know, setting your location. You know, if you're going to be doing a, a picture story on fireworks, it looks like in this first one here he gave a brighter exposure, and you see this desert and tents and trucks and people setting up, and then a similar shot with a darker exposure that just features the fireworks. I think it's nice to have both in your in your set of images. Great hair guy has got this this photograph here that makes great use of a water foreground. If you're lucky enough to be in a location that has water for the fireworks, it, it really helps because it, the reflection brightens up the foreground and fills out the whole frame. Um, I'm not quite sure where this building is. I'm sure someone out in the chat room could probably tell us they'll recognize it. But you've got the, the building here, you've got the, the bridge, you've got the, the reflections. And if you're doing it, thinking of doing an article for a magazine or something like this, this makes a great lead-in because there's a lot of negative space here for the magazine folks to put in um, the headline and some intro text and things like that. Somebody online is, uh, who, who Daddy is saying that it looks like Tempe, Arizona, Tempe Town Lake. So maybe, maybe that's it, where it, it is. Maybe, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, someone, when we were setting this up, Craig mentioned it looked like this building's leaning over, and I have no idea if that's the shape of the building, or it could be because the camera's tilted up a little bit to get the fireworks in the sky. You get that effect of the, the building falling backwards, but, you know, it's, it all works. Uh, the next issue we come to is stability. I know almost every one of us probably has a tripod at home, sitting in a corner, getting dust, uh, not being used. You know, this is the time to bring out that tripod, dust it off, and actually do use it. Um, it really helps for fireworks because we're going to be doing some long exposures. Along with the tripod, you probably want to have some sort of cable release. Um, these days, they're usually these electronic releases here. You know, just plugs into the side of the plugs into the side of the camera here, and it has a button here, and it has a a locking feature so you can lock the exposure open. Uh, there's a variety. This one's a pretty simple one. 
There's another one here that has an intervalometer on it, which we're not going to get into for fireworks. Uh, for fireworks are pretty much, we're going to be the intervalometer. We're going to press the button as needed. Um, what was that? The intervalometer? Intervalometer. Yeah, so with, Tell us a bit more about okay, what that is. Okay, with this here, you can set a self-timer, an intervalometer, the, the, the shutter speed, and how many frames. So um, the intervalometer will say take one shot every five seconds or every 10 seconds and do that for, for 10 frames. And you know, so there's all sorts of controls on, on this here that'll let you press the button and walk away. Uh, so I mean, if you want to shoot a flower as it's budding, you know, set your camera up and hook up this little here. What is this is called? This one's Canon's the TC80N3. Uh, it's a little more expensive than the remote switch, which is the RS80N3. Uh, all sorts of toys we can play with. We'll get into gear in a little bit too. Uh, let's see. Um, alternatives, if you don't have a tripod, you might consider a, a monopod. Um, I use monopods a lot, but mostly just to take some of the weight off the camera if I'm shooting a, a concert or something like that, and I've got a, you know, a large lens on there. I want to save my elbow and shoulder, so I use the monopod um, to, to stabilize a bit, but mostly to take the weight off. But there's other things like bean bags. Uh, you put a bean bag on the top of a fence post or on a fence rail or on a tree stump or something like that that can help stabilize your camera. Um, let's see. Focusing, uh, you probably don't want to use autofocus on fireworks. Uh, it may take the camera a second or so to, to focus in on something. What you should probably do is use the first burst or two of the fireworks show to establish where the fireworks are, get focused on them, and then turn off the autofocus on your camera. Just lock it down and um, keep shooting. Uh, it'll avoid the shutter lag, especially if you're doing a point-and-shoot camera, which we'll talk about separately. Right now, I mean, most of these items apply to all cameras, but mostly to d digital SLRs or to digital film cameras. There are some people out there using film. Uh, Do you shoot with film ever? Fireworks? No, not anymore. Not since yeah. digital. Um, I was a film shooter for many years. Um, you know, I started out in the large format world, shooting 11 by 14, 8 by 10, and I've worked my way down to 35 millimeter. And now digital, um, digital has just taken over for me. Though I have a lot of friends who do shoot film, and it's we always have these fun little banter's back and forth. Uh, they tell me film's not dead, and I tell them the other world's still flat. <laughs> now I, I respect the film shooters out there. It's a, it's a lot of work. <clears throat> John, I have a couple of questions yeah. about, you just talked about locking the focus, mm -hmm. and um, a couple of folks, Diane Poff and Vidnare, are asking, how do you lock the focus? Can you talk more about locking sure. the focus? Sure, I can I could at least talk about Canon. I believe most other cameras' systems are the same way. There's usually a focusing switch on the lens or on the camera body to turn autofocus off. So you want to just turn autofocus off, manually focus the lens, and leave it there. Uh, it's, it's not a lock or a switch or something that'll, that'll lock it there. But I mean, if your camera's on a tripod and the focus is set, it's probably, it shouldn't be changing on you. Uh, does that help? Yes. OK. Absolutely. Uh, we come to the, to the easy part of photographing fireworks, and that's the exposure. That's the easy part? That's the easy part. All right. Fireworks are bright. Uh, you know, I hear people there thinking about, oh, do I need to go to ISO 1600 for fireworks? No. Um, the lowest ISO your camera goes is where you should be. Um, in most Canons, it's 100. Uh, most other cameras, I think, are 100. There's a few cameras that may only go down to 200. Uh, but whatever is your lowest ISO is going to be the one, uh, which is helpful because there's less noise and grain in the images. And as I said, the fireworks are really bright. Um, you want to use a mid-range aperture. If you read articles online about shooting photographs of fireworks, they usually talk about f8 to f11. But I've noticed in the past few years, it seems like the fireworks are getting brighter. Uh, so now I find myself going around F11 or F16 at ISO 100. If your camera goes down to only ISO 200, you're probably going to be in the F11, F16, even F22 range. Uh, just remember, they're bright. Uh, the, the aperture will control the brightness of, of the um, firework display. 
Uh, your shutter speed is going to control the duration of it. Uh, do you want to get these streaks that you see in this image going up to the fireworks, or do you just want to catch the burst in midair? And that's going to be, be controlled by your shutter speeds. Uh, let's see. When you're first starting, you probably want to look at your, at your LCD, do some chimping, uh, but don't spend a lot of time looking at it because you're going to lose shots. I mean, just confirm that you've got good framing and that the exposure is there. Um, <clears throat> I originally wasn't going to talk about JPEG versus camera raw, versus raw cam, camera images, but I think this is a time where raw works because of setting white balance and having a little latitude in the exposure because you know, if you go from red to green to blue fireworks, the exposure is going to be a little bit different. So RAW may help you there. Um, I'm not religious about RAW versus JPEG. I mean, work with what works for you. You know, what you're comfortable shooting with. I'm, I'm not here to, to tell you how to do things. I'm here to offer suggestions, and you take them and use them as, as you, you see fit. Um, but we talk about shutter speeds then for the duration. You're thinking maybe we start with half or quarter second exposures if you're just going to fire the camera during the bursts, or we can go for longer exposures in the one to four sec second area, or we can use the bulb setting on the camera. Uh, is everyone familiar with the bulb setting? Well, we had folks in the chat room already ask about the bulb okay. setting. So let's, let's um, talk about that. Right now, I have a Canon 5D here. And um, on its mode dial, there's a settings for, for P, TV for time value, AV for aperture value, M for manual, and there's a B. And the B stands for bulb. And a bulb exposure lets the camera stay open for as long as you press the button. So here, when I, I've got the camera set to bulb, I press the button, and it stays the shutter open until I lift my finger. Um, some people may wonder where the, the bulb uh, term comes from. Uh, you know, it can be kind of confusing. I was talking to someone earlier today who thought it had something to do with firing off the flash and the flash bulb. Uh, but it really goes back to some old cameras here. So I don't know if you can come in on this lens here. Um, it's a lens from a view camera. And back then, we didn't have electronic cable releases. So we have this, this, this air tube here, and it comes here, and it has an air bulb at the end. And what would happen here is you press the bulb, opens the, the shutter, release it, and it closes the shutter. And then we reset the shutter for the next shot, open, and close. So this air bulb here is where the term bulb comes from. That's super cool. I never knew that. Oh, good. Going Thanks. to get something out there. Um, Oh, that's what we just talked about here, the bulb setting. Uh, the bulb setting helps for another thing, too, where we can do multiple exposures of the fireworks. And there we have a very sophisticated piece of equipment that we use along with the bulb shutter release, a black card. Uh, so what you would want to do is put the card in front of the camera so it's blocking any light from the lens. Open the lens, a firework display goes off and explodes in the air. Pull it away, go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, put the card back. Wait for the next explosion, pull the card away and back. And you can do that for two, three, four, four explosions and get multiple images there on, the, on one frame. How often um, do you do that? Quite often, actually. Really? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll vary between that or I'll sit there with the camera here. I've got the release on it. So I've got it on, on my tripod aimed at the, the fireworks and then I'll just go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, wait for the next burst. And these are doing individual shots, but if I want to do multiple shots, then I'll do it with, with the card. Um, as I say, the shutter speed isn't that important for the exposure. The exposure is controlled by the aperture. So the shutter, by varying the shutter speed is just varying the length of the trails of the fireworks. So I just kind of sit there and do a lot of these two seconds, four seconds, a half second, you know, just. You got a lot of tricks up your sleeve. John. Yeah, and short sleeves, though. <laughs> <laughs> so. I just wanted to uh, pass along a comment uh, uh -huh. in the chat room from YSAP, uh, who mentions that a black hat would work yeah. really well for I mean, that if trick. it's dark enough, even your hand or, or wear a glove or something. But, you know, if there's no light behind you to reflect off the whatever you put in front of the car, in uh, front of the um, the camera, and this is a kind of big card. We'd probably just, you know, you can cut a cut a piece out of it if you if you needed, just to work on it. Um, 
So that's the multiple exposures. We've, we looked at what the bulb shutter is, uh, how to set the bulb. As I mentioned on the Canons here, it's a setting right on the shutter, on the mode dial here. On some cameras, especially film cameras, you probably want to go to the shutter speed dial and look, it'll go down to like one second, two seconds, four seconds, eight seconds, and then bulb. So it depends on your camera where that setting is. Uh, check the manual to see how to set bulb. Uh, Compact point and shoot cameras probably won't have a bulb setting. Uh, so we'll talk about some other ways to, to work with compact in a little bit. Uh, flash, we talked about flash. <clears throat> I usually say turn the flash off. Uh, the fireworks are brighter than your flash and um, the, the flash isn't gonna add anything to the fireworks themselves, but it can annoy the people around you. Um, but as someone was saying, well, you, can you use a low powered flash Yes, uh, and a couple images we've got from other people here have some people in the, in the foreground and we'll show them maybe that's a time to use it but, uh, when your subject knows what's going on. But most of the time the flesh is ineffective and annoying. Here's everyone's favorite, the gear, the gear section. Um, obviously you have a camera. Um, figure everyone's probably got their camera chosen already, know what, what they're going to be using here. Uh, so we, I think we can kind of skip over that one pretty quickly. We'll talk about lens choice. Um, zoom lenses really help for fireworks. Um, you know, you're going to be locked down in one position, so the zoom will let you come in and out to reframe the image. Uh, so in the beginning, you can start with a wider shot and get an establishing view of where the fireworks are being set off uh, before there's a lot of smoke. And as the show goes on, maybe you'll zoom in a bit to get more close-ups or portraits of the fireworks. Um, like the 24 to 105 range is probably a good, good place to start. Um, if you have a lens with even a longer range, you know, 24 to 200 or an 18 to 200 and all, then, then you really have a lot to work with. Um, you know, focal length here just determines the framing because the camera's not moving, it's not changing your perspective or distortion or anything like that. Uh, that's all controlled by the camera to subject distance, which you're fixed at here. So the zoom's just gonna reframe the image for you. Um, so a wide range zoom helps and it doesn't have to be a fast zoom. <clears throat> As we said, the exposures are gonna be around F11 or F16. So you know, if you have a zoom lens that only opens to 5.6, that's not gonna be an issue for the fireworks. Uh, and also with the zoom lens, you can have some fun and be creative with it. You can try zooming during the exposure, you know, and see what that does. Get some streaks going out sideways from the fireworks. Uh, try zooming in and zooming out. You know, set your focus first and, and then zoom the camera during the exposure. Susan. John, yes. do you do that a lot? I don't, I don't really recall seeing too many photographs of fireworks where people are zooming. I don't do it a lot. Um, I'll do it a few just as experiments. I mean, okay. one of the big things about this is having fun and trying things, right. you know, especially if you're digital and you, you've, you've paid for your film in advance that way, right. you know, so <laughs> might as well use it. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to talk about tripod heads. You know, we were saying use a tripod and there's various tripod heads here. I brought a few with me that, you know, there's the old style pan and tilt. Uh, so we can just loosen these and you, you stick it the camera by tilting these and twisting. And there's ball heads here, and I brought a couple of styles of ball heads so people can see what they are um, from relatively inexpensive, getting a little, little more um, costly here. Um, for years, I was pretty much a pan and tilt person. Uh, I like the idea of ball heads, but I've never really been happy with the way they work uh, because the, the camera is stuck on this stem and it's cantilevered off. It's hard to set a, a vertical shot with this because of the weight of the camera pulling it down. You often have to get L plates to put on the camera. Um, an L plate goes around the camera and puts the tripod mount down at the bottom so you don't have to hang the camera off the side. Uh, but recently I've discovered a couple of ball heads that I really like. Uh, one is from Arca Swiss and the other is this um, Manfrotto um, head here, which they call their horizontal joysticks. And what happens with these, the camera is mounted on the ball and the stem is under the camera. So you can lock the camera in almost any position with the weight being evenly distributed. Uh, so I think these are, these are great. You, as you're shooting, you can aim with, with this here and keep your hand on the trigger. Um, 
for fireworks, it probably doesn't really matter which one, but you know, if you're going to you know, go out and buy a tripod for it, you know, try a bunch of different heads and see, see which one works best for you. Um, I mean, wall heads have a lot of people that really like them. It just hasn't, hasn't worked for me, so it comes down to personal choice. Um, some other things to have around with you, a, a flashlight, and I've got a couple of different flashlights here, the standard mag light or this one that can mount on, on the camera or even a, a bicycle headlight. And, you know, as you're working in, in the dark of the fireworks, it helps to be able to set the camera settings. I know we all strive to say we, we memorize where all the settings are on the camera, but if it's the first time you're working in the dark, you know, you may want to have to look at the buttons and, and having a flashlight along with you really helps that out. Hey, John, John. Yeah. Um, maybe after we finish this, <clears throat> just a reminder, you are dealing with a room full of photographers here. Uh -huh. So if we could just talk about settings. Um, people are asking about white balance, shutter speed, uh -huh. things like that. I know we've covered ISO and aperture. Yeah. But um, can you just be really thorough about that stuff? Yeah, well, shutter speed is bulb. Uh, oh, right. So, so you're going to hold the shutter speed and count it out. Uh, the shutter speed really controls the, the trails of the fireworks, not the, not the brightness of them. The aperture is the brightness, and there you're going to be set at around f11 or, or 16, depending on how bright the fireworks are. So I said the exposure is the easy part because it's almost always the same. Okay. Uh, there's not a lot to go through there. And white balance? You're on auto? Uh, white balance. I, that's why I said maybe shoot raw for fireworks. Um, because the auto white balance can be affected by the colors of the fireworks. Um, so maybe just set it to daylight or tungsten and be able to change it later in your processing. Uh, if you're shooting JPEG, I'd, I'd, I would try the auto white balance. I mean, it's sort of like shooting in a theater. Uh, I think the auto will give you a, a pretty good, good place to start from. Okay, and you're always on bulb? Um, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, if on a SLR, on a okay. compact camera that doesn't have bulb, you won't be. And that we'll talk about there. Try some things in like the half second to one second range. Try a few exposures, two seconds, four seconds. Um, you know, there's... And auto, oh, yeah. Sorry, one more thing. Autofocus. Yeah. Are you always in autofocus? No, we, we talked about that. Um, one of the first slides there was to turn autofocus off. Oh, Just wow. get okay. your focus you know, focus on some of the early bursts because most of the fireworks are going up in the same plane and they're far enough away that, that you're going to be covered by your depth of field. So just get the camera focused and turn the autofocus off so it's locked there. Uh, just confirm your focus once in a while so in case you banged it while you're, while you're shooting. Um, with the modern S SLR, autofocus will probably work because the fireworks are bright and be able to lock on it. But with a compact camera or some older cameras that focus slow or only have one or two um, autofocus points, you know, it's too, too much of a chance of the camera missing or, you know, racking the lens back and forth while the fireworks going off. So I try to be in manual focus as much as possible. Okay, thanks for the recap. Sure. And is that, uh, people are definitely asking about the whole focus thing. The what? Is it the, about focus. Uh -huh. Is it hard to focus on, on the fireworks I don't, in manual I, when they're that far away? And no, because uh, that's why I'm saying if you're using a longer lens, 100 right. to 200 millimeter lens, I mean, it's filling the frame and, and they're bright. You can see, I think they're very easy to focus on. Um, or you can try even turning on the autofocus, though, for the first frame, see if that locks on it, and if it does, then turn the, the switch off. Um, but manual focus is the way I've usually gone for fireworks. Okay, one more question, we'll yeah. let you keep, keep going. Nice. Um, the Vidner, Vidnere, I'm not really sure how to say that name. Can you suggest uh, in which metering helps here? No metering. No metering. No metering. Um, okay. As I said, the fireworks are always about the same brightness, so just um, F11 or F16 for the to, control the brightness and then the shutter speed to control the, the, the streaks that the fireworks make, whether you want to catch them while they're flying or if you just want to stop them in, in midair. Um, yeah, your metering is going to get all thrown off by the fireworks. It's probably be very frustrating to try to meter. Uh, you can tell everyone you work in manual mode here and it's because it's easy. <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> Let's see, we talked about 
um, having the flashlight with you, extra batteries. You know, you're going to be doing these long exposures and probably a lot of exposures. Uh, go out there with your battery freshly charged and have a spare just in case you run through it. Uh, it's really frustrating to be halfway through a fireworks show and, you know, and all of a sudden getting seeing that battery thing flashing there and I don't have another one to go. So extra battery. Now there should be another item on here. You know, have your memory cards ready. Format them before the show starts. Um, you know, you don't want to start shooting and three shots into it, all of a sudden you get card full because it still have images from your last session. Uh, if you're going to have multiple cards, have them all formatted in advance. You don't want to finish one card, pop in another one, and then have to go through your menu and find the format and take your time, you know, while you're missing shots. So just be prepared is the, is the basic thing to say here. And John, um, do you have a speed that you recommend as far as the memory card? No. Doesn't matter. Okay. No. No, it's, we're not shooting video or anything that's doing a lot of, a lot of transfer. Um, other things that you may want to have, I mean, the, some people really enjoy the percussive explosions of the fireworks, some people don't, so maybe a set of earplugs. Uh, depends on how close you are to the firework display, uh, but uh, I'd be remiss to not mention earplugs because I have cases of earplugs at home and my wife keeps finding them all over and go, what are you doing with all these earplugs? And they were from camping trips and, and the like, so I was known for my earplugs. <laughs> uh, and also here in Seattle, it almost always rains on the 4th of July, though they're telling us it's going to be nice this year. I don't believe them yet. So sometimes you may want to have a plastic bag or something to cover the camera. Uh, this is an Optec rain sleeve. And um, most camera stores carry these, or like two of them for eight or ten bucks or so. And basically, you know, you can put the, the camera goes up in one end of this, and, and then this end pulls up over the lens. draw a string here so you can there's a hole here for your IP so you can still look through it and aim and focus and you just have some weather protection um, I mean you probably don't need to know this it's a real heavy downpour but here in Seattle we we try to keep these things in mind um, okay let's, uh, let's see we talked about the tripod heads the ball and versus the pan tilt and my favorite tripod head these days um, so techniques, we talked about the black card already, so it fell over here. Um, opening the shutter on bulb and using a black card or a black hat or something to, to do multiple exposures. Um, and that way we can get a number of, of bursts into the same scene. So that, let's take some more questions here. That really covers most of the DSLR stuff and then we'll get into some compact cameras and possibly some t cell phone cameras. Uh, so what do you have for me there? Um, no one said ask a question if you could suggest compositions. Can I, Com if you could suggest some compositions. Suggest compositions. I mean, that's an interesting one. Um, for composition for me or framing as a call it in photography uh, instead of composition. Like in this image here, getting some foreground images, it's great, it's on a lake. We have these boats in there um, and we're just getting the burst filling the frame. Uh, you will probably want to mix some horizontal and um, vertical images. It really depends on the display. For most fireworks are pretty, pretty straight up and we'll talk about that as we look at some other people's uh, photos on what they've done for the composition. Uh, but, but sometimes like the, the 4th of July fireworks here in Seattle are shot off from a wide barge and some of the shots have maybe six or eight displays going up at once so that's a time to, to turn to the horizontal and fill the frame that way. Um, I hope that covers some of the idea of that. <laughs> Do you have any examples of with the black card that multiple? Experience? I don't know it's it's I, it's hard to tell sometimes you know how I how I shot them when when I come back at the end um, it's, I, yeah, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember which ones were done that way. Um, you could tell they're usually the shots that are close-ups of the fireworks in the sky that don't include any landscape or things around it, because it, it wouldn't work in this image because these boats are on the water and they're kind of rocking. 
so we would get ghosts of those. So the, that technique tends to work if you're in a place where you're really just shooting up into the sky. Okay, we have a ton of questions, John. Okay. All right, people are very curious. <laughs> Todd H. would like to, or said, my firework streaks tend to be too white. I want more saturation in the colored fireworks. Is this a shutter speed issue? It's probably more an aperture issue. Uh, the aperture is really controlling the brightness because that, that firework is streaking up, so it's not in any one spot for a long time for the shutter speed to really affect it. You know, you may want to stop down a bit, but a lot of times that initial... Um, shell that's going up is white so we we do have that issue to deal with and there's not a lot you can do about it except stop down a little more but that sometimes affects the the brightness of the burst too um, luckily sometimes the the shells go up in purple or blue or green and those tend to record a lot better uh, but i would i would try playing with the aperture more than the shutter speed to control that great a couple of questions <clears throat> um about neutral density filters. Uh -huh. Would you use those or any other kinds of filters when photographing I, fireworks? I tend to not use too many filters. Uh, the neutral density filter would come in handy if your camera doesn't stop down to 16 or, or 22, but most of the lenses I think we're using will do that. Uh, when we talk about compact cameras, they're there actually is a use for neutral density filters. Uh, one of my concerns with filters when shooting fireworks is how bright they are. And you know, the filter's adding another layer of glass between you and the camera. It's flat, the sensor's flat. Sometimes you're gonna get these weird reflections between the filter and the sensor. The light bounces back and forth and you'll get ghost images of the fireworks or other bright lights. Um, sometimes if you see an image where there's maybe bright lights in the corner and then a ghost in the opposite corner. That's usually from a filter on the, on the lens that, you know, it's not, it doesn't have really great coating on it. So it causes these internal reflections. So I, I try to avoid filters as much as I can. Timo Bauer had asked, can you talk about doing a portrait of a person with flash and then fireworks in the background? Yes. Um, that's the time where you want the, the flash and, um, Again, you're going, to, you're going to go for the long exposure. Uh, it's like doing a double exposure. Think of it as, as doing a double exposure. The, the flash is going to control the brightness of the person. Um, if your flash, has, most flashes today are ETTL, you know, the through the lens metering. So if you set your camera to, to 16 and to like a two second or a bulb exposure, when you fire the flash, it's going to read the person and give the right flash exposure and then the fireworks are going to go off in the background. So I think it'd probably be pretty easy to do. I, I haven't done it myself, uh, but it it's, sounds pretty similar to trying to mix daylight and strobe too for fill flash. You know, you, the flash, the aperture controls the brightness and the shutter speed control of the brightness of the um, person and the shutter speed controls the ambient light in the background. Cool. Uh, I have a couple of questions about um, about setting. We talked about mm -hmm. being in manual focus. Yeah. A couple of folks have asked about just setting your focus to infinity. Yes. That... And then somebody, Mar Margarita Quintiero, mm -hmm. uh, said, I've read that we should focus to infinity and then just turn it back a little bit. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. Uh, with the shorter lens, focusing to infinity is probably going to be the way to go. Um, with a, a longer lens, if you're shooting a 200 or 300 millimeter lens, I'd, I'd probably want to do the manual focus just to confirm, uh, just because there's less depth of field because of the magnification from those lenses. Um, talking about coming back from infinity, uh, many lenses actually focus past infinity. Um, the reason for that is for thermal expansion, if it's hotter or colder, the, the lens may focus slightly different. So it gives the, the room some slack, the lens some slack there. Um, I don't know if you can come in on, on this camera at all and, and see in the window there, the, inf the camera never reaches the infinity mark. The infinity mark is actually the upward piece of this L here. Uh, so there's your, probably your infinity focus. You don't go to the infinity symbol that's past the, the mark. Um, so that's why people say sometimes pull back slightly from infinity and, you know, it's John, I have a question yeah. from Denise in the chat room who said that, that she's heard when using a tripod, you should turn off the IS on your lens. Um, is that 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I wasn't even thinking about IS. The, the, the lens I was using here doesn't have um, image, IS is image stabilization. That's the Canon term. Uh, it's VR for Nikon vibration reduction, OS for uh, some of the third party um, lenses. And what that does is there's a, a gyro and a motor in the lens so that if, when the lens detects the camera's moving, it'll move the lenses to compensate for that, that, that motion. Uh, when you're on a tripod, there is no motion and sometimes uh, the system might try to, to compensate for that and end up adding vibration. Uh, the newer vibration reduction systems supposedly can sense when they're on a tripod and will, will, it won't affect the image, but if you have an older lens, it probably will. But for this situation, I'd probably just turn off the IS anyway. So yeah, good point. Cool. I have a question from Sam Cox. Is the lens hood important when shooting fireworks? For me, lens hoods are important, but for, for protection and for um, blocking stray light from the sides. And fireworks, it's probably not that much of an issue because all the light is coming at you from straight ahead. So the, the lens hood's not gonna block anything there. Uh, what the lens hood would help is if there were some bright lights on the side of you that may be shining off the lens and causing glare. Um, I just make a habit of always using a lens hood because, because I don't have filters on the front of the lens. So it's a protection item. I have another question from Sam Cox um, who would like to know if do you have to wait for dark to shoot, or can you shoot when the sky is still somewhat blue? And I mean, growing up in Alaska, in uh -huh. July 4th, yeah, it's, so it's, it's not right. dark. So um, I mean, I'm sure that's as true. As we saw in one of the, the early examples here, there was someone who shot against the, the lighter blue sky, and I think it works really nice. I mean, it, it gives a totally different look to the fireworks. We're so used to seeing them on black that having some blue in the sky, I, I think it works. Um, your exposure is going to be a little more tricky. Um, but you know, what's where you're looking at the, the back of the camera and chimping and, and getting it balanced in. Uh, there is a point where I think white balance may actually be an important thing. Try setting the white balance to tungsten and that'll really enhance the blue of the sky because uh, there's still some daylight in there and it's gonna really make that blue. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would love to try shooting fireworks against a different color sky than black. Another question mm -hmm. from um, Anuj Jamiri. Uh, how to avoid ex overexposed on the center when, while the branches are in perfect exposure? Or is that just what happens? That's mostly, <laughs> basically what happens. Um, that's what, you may wait till the, the, the initial burst actually is fired and then, then open the shutter. Um, but that way you're not gonna get the streaks going up. Uh, but here, you know, look at the image on the screen right now, and they, the centers of the, all of these are blown out. There's really nothing you can do about them. If you exposed for that really bright spot, you're not going to have anything else in the frame. Uh, so that's just something we, we live with, uh, and people, I guess, expect to see that in there. TA4 would like to know if you can do a once-a-week Q&A on photography. Here I would, we, I, it's an idea. We'll, we'll consider that. <laughs> I, would, I would love to do something like that. We love it. We learn a lot from you, John. <laughs> Thanks. Um, if you could just talk a little bit more about handheld uh -huh. um, care, I was kind of asking, I think quite a few people, I know we've talked about tripod and kind of touched on handheld, but. Yeah, uh, I mean, a, a tripod is something that we all probably own and have sitting in a corner. I know I don't use my tripod all that much. You know, I always say tripods are for big cameras. That's why we have little cameras, so we don't need to use tripods. Um, hand holding for fireworks, it could, it could probably work. I, I haven't done it much, but if we're, um, you know, it's going to add some randomness to it. Some of the, the shots are going to have squiggles instead of straight lines coming off from any of the burst here. You know, your, your camera hands are going to shake a little bit and it may add an interesting effect, uh, but I don't know if I'd want to do them all that way. That's why I was saying if you don't have a tripod, maybe a monopod might help steady a little bit or a bean bag that you can put the camera on and point up, you know, on a fence post or, you know, a street sign, a low, low sign, a tree stump or something. So just a little more stability. I, I, um, I do talk about having fun in, and later in a later slide and taking it off the tripod or kicking the tripod, you know, just do things to, to shake it up a bit. Uh, but I think some of the shots should be pretty stable. 
Chris Walt uh, wants to know, we talked a little bit about filters, but when that sky is still visible, what do you uh -huh. think about a magenta filter? I don't know. I mean, when the sky's still visible, I was saying go to the tungsten white balance setting to make it more blue. The magenta would kind of fight the blue, and I think it might, might make the sky a little duller. Uh, unless, unless you're pointing toward the sunset, maybe, and then the magenta might fill. I've never shot fireworks against a sunset, though. I think they'd be pretty difficult to, to read because you'll be competing um, with the brightness of the sky there. I think, I think I would shoot away from the, the sunset just to have a little darker sky. You know, it doesn't have to be black. You want a, a deep blue. Um, but, you know, try it. That's, that's the, the beauty of photography. There's, I'm not saying there's any rights or wrongs. You know, you shoot for yourself. You know, if you enjoy it, you, it's good. You know, you don't, don't shoot for everyone else, you know. Lori had asked if you can use the same guidelines um, when taking light photos at night, photos of lights at night? Yes, uh, I mean, that's the lights at night, you, you do think of doing like streaking car lights or street signs or you know down the, going down the highway and getting built, lit up billboards and most of this stuff applies there you want to stabilize the camera um, use the aperture to control the brightness and the shutter speed to control the duration of the lights that happen to be moving during this shot John we we have more questions for you okay. always questions but do you want to <laughs> yeah, let's keep go going? on for a little yeah. bit we're okay. just going to go into you know point and shoot uh, it's going to be the same things though, location, stability, and exposure. Um, the location and stability are the, are the same as we've been talking about, you know, uh, find, a, find a good spot, avoid clutter, uh, the stability, get the camera to, to, uh, to not shake, to get crisp shots of the fireworks. But now we come to exposure, um, and exposure can be an issue here. Um, we're talking about shooting it at F11 or F16. Many of you with compact cameras are probably saying to yourself, my camera only stops down to F8. Uh, almost all compact cameras that I'm familiar with only go down to F8. Uh, but sometimes they offer a lower ISO, like Canon sometimes has a 50 or an 80 ISO. So you want to go even to a lower ISO to avoid overexposure. Um, the Canon G-series cameras have a built-in neutral density filter. Someone was talking, asking about neutral density before. There's a setting on the camera that pops a neutral density filter into the into the lens and that gives you three stops so you can open up to maybe 5.6 or so to get your shutter uh, to get your exposures there um, the point and shoots probably don't have a bulb setting either so there you want to set a long exposure two seconds four seconds eight seconds and again use the the, the black card trick or your hand over the lens to get multiple bursts into it and because you can't can't lock the shutter open so maybe set it to 30 seconds and do a couple of these in front of it. Um, some cameras have a dedicated fireworks setting on point and shoots. Uh, I was looking at a Canon G10 last night. It has a setting and what it basically does, it sets the ISO to 80, uh, two second exposure at F8, which is sort of about what we've been talking about. So I was glad to see it agreed with <laughs> what I've been saying. Uh, focusing on small cameras. Here's where you really don't want autofocus because I'm sure many of you using compact cameras realize you press the button and wait for the camera to, to find focus and the scene's gone before the camera, camera takes it. So if your camera offers a manual focusing, uh, do that and set it to infinity. Uh, if it doesn't have uh, an autofocus mode, see if there's a landscape mode. Um, Otherwise, you're just going to have to play a bit with it. You, you know, point the, push the shutter down halfway as the fireworks exploding, and hopefully it, it can capture focus before the fireworks gone, and and then finish taking the picture. So, um, point and shoots offer a little more challenge, but you know, sometimes the challenge is fun. Uh, shoot a lot as with everything else. Um, so, from there we go to cell phones, especially the iPhone. Um, Guess what the three variables there are? <laughs> Location, <laughs> stability, and exposure. Uh, location, you're almost always very wide with a cell phone, so you really have to be aware of power lines and telephone poles and light posts and the like, because uh, almost definitely they're gonna make it into the shot, so just know where they are, 
and make use of them in your composition or you know just really get close on under the fireworks if you can. Uh, some places you can do that for safety reasons, you're probably pushed back or if the fireworks are being shut off in the water, um, you know, there's not much you can do. So uh, just be, be aware of your location. Uh, the stability, um, there, here we have this iPhone case uh, that, that doubles as a tripod mount. So let's see how this works. It's locked on. Wow, I haven't seen that before. Is that yours, John? Yeah, but it's for an iPhone 3, but I have an iPhone 4, but, so I used to use it. But anyway, it's a standard iPhone case. Uh, this comes from Joby, who makes the Gorilla Pods, and they, they sell them together, so it's a standard, could work as your all-time case, if you like, and then you can snap it onto their little tripod and you know, set it on a tree stump or a fence post or, or onto a regular tripod, and it just helps you stabilize the, the iPhone camera a bit. Of course, it's going to be facing that way. Um, there's probably some from a few other manufacturers. Actually, Celeste brought one in here called a Glyph, or I think it is G-L-I-F or G-L-I-G-F. It's hard to tell from, from their logo, but this one's for the iPhone 4. And basically, the, the phone just snaps into here, and then it's got a standard quarter thread, a quarter 20 thread that you can put on a, on a tripod and press in there and, and have your camera stabilized. Um, exposures with the, the iPhone, there's very little exposure control. The iPhone is fixed at f2.8. Um, it varies the ISO and the shutter speed according to the scene brightness to try to give you your exposure. On the, the newer iPhones, the 3GS and the 4, you can tap on the screen to show the camera where you want to focus and meter on. Um, so there you may want to wait till the, the burst is actually happening. Tap quickly on the burst for it to focus and then hit the shutter button. Uh, keep in mind, on, at least on the iPhones, that the picture is taken when you release your finger from the button. So you can kind of hold your finger on the button waiting for the action that you want and then lift and that's when it takes the, the, the shot. Um, again, just shoot a lot, have fun with it. Uh, expect some good things, expect some not some good things, expect a lot of junk, but you know, just uh, we say the difference between an amateur and a professional is the professional just doesn't show you their junk, you know, just throw it away, you know, and show everyone the great shots that you got with it. Um, I like so, that. Yeah, so good you, to know, John. So you want to be, be playing as you're out there, you know, try, as we mentioned earlier, try zooming the lens during the exposure and see what happens. Uh, might work, might not work, you know, it's, but we have this chance to experiment. Uh, try hand holding the camera and getting some shake and some jitters into the, the, the streaks of the fireworks. You know, if you're on, if you don't want to take it off the tripod, kick the tripod, you know, bounce it, bounce into it with your hand, you know, just make it shake a little bit, give some, some life and dynamism to the, to the photo. Um, we asked some, some of our, um, the viewers to send in some photos uh, earlier this week and um, of just break the rules. I remember, there are no rules. You know, it's photography. Do what you want. You know, don't, don't be doing it for everyone else. Do it for yourself. Enjoy it and come up with some experiments and, you know, be your, be your own self, you know. <laughs> um, these here from Blue Monkey 08, Eric Lamb. I'm um, not quite sure how these were done, but these looked great. He, he talks about it uh, in the Flickr stream about these were taken with a prime lens, either a 50 or a 100. And what it sounds like he did is did a long exposure. And while the exposure was happening, he defocused the camera. So, you know, he, he set, set the focus so that we get these sharp points in it. And while the shutter's open, turn the focusing ring. Um, I've never tried it. I thought these are great examples, you know, so. Full credit goes to Eric on, on these. Those are beautiful. Yeah. They're really beautiful. Yeah, there's probably more in his um, Flickr stream if you go look for him there, Blue Monkey 08. Here's an interesting one from David M. Um, black and white, you know, we're always talking about color and setting white balance and things like that. And here we can go to black and white and not worry about it. It's a very elegant shot. Um, clearly shows a, a, a city, a sense of location. It's got the water foreground. <clears throat> it's got the fireworks. It's got room for copy if we were going to sell it to a magazine or something like that. Um, the sense of place and no color, and it works, I think, very well. And uh, some of my friends are 
hear me go on all the time, oh, focus is overrated. Uh, and, and here we are with Kashin's um, image. Hope I get these names right. I mean, it could be fireworks, it could be holiday lights in a bush, in a tree or something, we don't know. And that's part of the, the allure of the photo. Make sure you ask questions, make sure you stay with it longer and figure out what's, what's really going on here. Um, you know, we're talking about sometimes missing the focus is okay. Uh, found a portrait, maybe not, but... <laughs> I really you like know, that effect abstract. a lot. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do a few more samples from our viewers. You know, thank you so much for, for sending these in. Uh, Linda Brinkerhoff here has this great example of framing the, the shot. Uh, we could see there's just enough detail around the edges to see these trees and bushes. Uh, great placement of the firework display in there. And the sky is blue. You know, someone was asking, you know, before it's totally dark. Um, there's some, some light in the trees. Um, and again, the, the, the tungsten, it may have been a tungsten balance to give it that extra blue, or the sky may have been that color. You know, play with your white balance. Um, shoot these in raw so you can vary that easily. Um, but I, I just, we all thought this was a pretty exciting, great image. Um, Carmen Weicker sent these in, and the comment there was, you know, I just love to shoot everything. I didn't know what I was doing here. Go ahead and critique away. And I, I think these are great. Again, the blue skies. The top one reminds me of a palm, palm tree. Uh, the bottom one's just this, this big explosion that I can see using, a, using in different ways. Again, we've got the blue background going on behind it and makes, it, makes them stand out from some of the other fireworks shots that we've seen over the years. Here we have a couple of very elegant images here. Um, I'm assuming that Nasada One is the name here, assuming that they uh, used a very short, shorter shutter speed for the, the first one there. That sort of looks like a view of the galaxy where everything's just standing still in place. And then the longer shutter speed on the other one that gives us the streaks coming from the firework. Uh, both really nicely done and an elegant look. Uh, Dave Gray here, again, over the water. And this one adds this natural element here of these ducks or swans that seem seemingly unfazed by what's going on around them, swimming through it. I think it's a, just a great touch. Um, there's a tree branch coming in. There's some clouds in the sky. There's smoke from the fireworks. And they, they just all come together very nicely here. That water in the foreground is always a, a helpful thing. Uh, here, positively, Linda and Sam Pfeiffer. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, so many of these uh, fireworks shots are tall verticals, and there's a lot of room off to the side. So Sam took took three shots here, cropped them in tight, and made a triptych out of it. You know, be, experiment with your stuff. Make some diptychs and triptychs and some things you can put on your wall or make cards from. I mean, th these were great. Um, someone asked about getting people into the foreground. Here's one from Mama Cowan. Um, this one looks like it probably wasn't with flash, but this is a, a situation where you probably could turn on the flash and get that person. And by turning on the flash, you can stop down your aperture quite a bit more and get a little more detail in the fireworks. Um, and then Monkey Pile here has a different perspective, you know, looking down on a harbor. So we have the fireworks, we have the reflections in the water, and we have other lights going on in the harbor. Um, you know, here in Seattle, we, you can go up onto um, Queen Anne Hill or Capitol Hill and kind of look down on the fireworks display. You know, that's part of the scouting thing. See if you can get there a day or in advance and, and look for different locations. And um, if there's a place that does fireworks every weekend, like the, the shore or something, that's, that's really great. Uh, it's probably not going to be so much traffic as, you know, a big display here in, in for the 4th of July here in Seattle. You're stuck in traffic. Of, you know, getting there, getting your location. You probably want to get there like at noon for a 10 o'clock show so you can map out your spot and then just be prepared to wait a few hours to get home. Uh, but, it, you know, get some great shots that make it all worth it. Um, and here's another beautiful shot of this, this kid holding a sparkler. I mean, a sparkler is a type of firework. And there's this proud, intense look on the kid's face. Uh, and the human element just ties it all together. A lot of people that know me know I'm primarily portrait people, photographers. So when I saw this, I thought this was great. Um, and fireworks are, you know, sparklers are fireworks. And I think we're going to even try some sparkler shots here in a few minutes. I think we still have some time to do all that. All right. Um, but, you know, most of all, it's uh, have fun, you know. That's, that's <laughs> my mom. She's 91 and still having fun and 
playing with fireworks here, you know, let's... That's your mom? It is. John's mom, <laughs> folks. <laughs> She's awesome. So uh, let's take a break for a couple of seconds, gather, gather some questions, and then we'll go over and try to shoot a couple images and see what happens. So let's take five minutes. Five minute break? Works for everyone. We, no. we do have a bunch more questions if you want to okay. yeah, do well, that now. Yeah. Or? yeah, let's do some now and then we'll move over there. Okay, okay so take the break in a few minutes. Okay, okay cool. So back um, to questions. Let's ask some questions. Can you, Skydiver would like to know if you can talk or cover any post-processing tips or tricks. I don't do a lot of post-processing. Uh, most of the images that we showed here, uh, are more, the, my images that were on the slides with the instructions were uh, just brought into Lightroom. Uh, some of them was, were actually shot JPEG, some of those were shot in RAW. Um, what I may do is boost the blacks, you know, if there's a lot of smoke in the sky. Uh, so just to try to counteract the blacks. I mean, I, I, we saw the blue sky ones really work, the black sky ones really work. Sometimes when it's somewhere in between, a gray sky is not so great. So maybe boosting the blacks, uh, maybe playing a little bit with the vibrance controls. Um, I don't know, maybe if we have time after we shoot some things here, we, we're going to bring them into Lightroom, so maybe we can see what some of the things that can go on in there. The question from Mamadou was, how do you expose in that sparkler shot? And somebody else had earlier asked about shooting kids with mm -hmm. sparklers. Uh, sparklers are really bright. I mean, they're, they're maybe even brighter than fireworks. Um, so I, I think there you can, you can probably meter with the camera for that, that shot. Uh, you, you're going to need a pretty quick shutter speed here. We're not going for the, the long shutter speed of the fireworks on this. Um, so you want a, a short enough shutter speed that you're not going to get sham, camera shake or the, the subject moving. Uh, but the, the sparkler, just a little bit in front of the face, is bright enough to light them up pretty well. Uh, don't ask me about white balance there. I have no idea what the white balance from the sparkler is. Shoot in raw, adjust it later to, your, to, to taste. <laughs> Always oh, sound advice. Um, Tor Bang would like to know if you can address shooting with lots of clouds in the sky, if that has any effect on the photos or the fireworks. Um, there's not much you can do about it. I mean, uh, the clouds are sort of like the smoke images, or sometimes you shoot a fireworks and the moon is in the scene. Uh, that gives you some difficulties because the moon from your long exposures is going to move and blur in the sky. Uh, that's another time for location scouting the night before uh, to know where the moon is. Uh, realize that the moon comes up about an hour later each night, so it's not going to be exactly where it was the, the, the night you scouted. Um, clouds can, can be tough. Uh, they can also add to it by having a reflective surface above the fireworks, you know, so the sky lights up a bit more. Um, but then again, maybe in post-processing, that's where boosting up the blacks or adding a little bit of vignette uh, around the image to, to darken it down may come in. A little technical question from mm -hmm. Greg G. Uh, do you use the long exposure noise reduction setting when shooting fireworks? I've never really thought about it. Um, I don't usually have, I've got the default set in the camera and um, I haven't really changed them. I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Question from one of our regulars, Kaothea, in the chat room. Have you ever used the multiple exposure feature in the camera instead of the black card technique? Uh, I'm shooting Canon, so I don't have the multiple exposure oh. feature in, in the <laughs> camera. Uh, okay, yeah, he's an icon shooter. I yeah, yeah. I, I, I would probably still go with the card. Then. I just think I have a little more, more control because I think when you're shooting the um, multiple exposure, you have to set the number of exposures in advance. You know, and it's something else to fiddle with on the camera and set and remember to turn it off for the next shot or turn it back on again. By doing the, the bulb and the card, you can, you can do it or not do it without having to change any settings on the camera. I think you may have talked about this, John, but a okay. uh, question on Twitter from Gabriel Pita was, how do you deal with the smoke generated by the fireworks? Do you do that in post-process? Hope that it's windy, <laughs> windy <laughs> enough to move the smoke. Uh, that's why I said, you know, get some of the, the wider establishing shots at the beginning when there's less smoke. And as the smoke builds up, maybe come in, come in with your zoom or longer lens to get more close-ups of the fireworks in the sky. Um, luckily, in most shows, 
the fireworks are going on at different levels. So if, if there's smoke low, the next burst may be higher, so you can get up there. And then when that smoke's up higher, you can shoot the next burst down low. Um, the, but you know, smoke is your nemesis there. So hopefully it's, it clears up for you. Yeah, again, boosting the black levels in post-processing will, will hide some of the smoke, but you get to a point where it starts cutting down the brightness of the fireworks too. So it's all a balancing act. So we'll take one more question from Jam. Mm -hmm. um, I know you talked about shooting in manual focus mm -hmm. and they'd like to know, how do you tell if you're in focus? Are you zooming in while the fireworks are? No, the fireworks or? are pretty bright and, and distinct. So, I mean, if you're decent eyesight, I think you can see, you know, when, when you look through the, the viewfinder, um, you can also try, I guess, on the newer cameras, live view and do the focus there. And then with the live view, you can zoom in and one, most of the fireworks are about the same distance away from you, so once you've got it uh, locked in, it's, it's usually pretty pretty close. But you know, check every every few minutes to make sure you haven't bumped the camera or changed the focus. Um, yeah, if you're if you're recomposing or focusing, refocusing, excuse me, then you're. Gonna yeah, have if, if, if you're going to zoom between shots, refocus at the focal length you're going to shoot at. Uh, a lot of zoom lenses don't maintain focus as you zoom in and out. You know, the more expensive ones are supposed to, but even there I would, would test it or focus at the wide end and then, um, you know, f rather focus at the, the long end where there's less, more magnification, less depth of field, and then as you zoom out, you know, a better chance of holding the focus. They're both fighting for the button there. Which one's gonna press it? <laughs> We think we're done with questions and then they keep coming. That's okay. Um, uh, one more focus question from Claire of RA, because I saw this question earlier as well. How about using hyperfocal distance for focal? For focus? Yeah, that, that sort of goes along with the, the focus to infinity. Uh, it's just so many lenses now don't have a hyperfocal scale on them. Um, so if you have the hyperfocal scale, just set you know, in infinity at f16, this lens doesn't, this lens here has a hyper, this is a Canon 85 millimeter. Uh, the only hyperfocal scale it has is for f22. And there, it says at f22, it's in focus from about 16 feet to infinity. So that, that should cover it. So hyperfocal distance focusing is a technique to use here. Uh, it's probably a little more to go into but here, but you can, do a Google search on hyperfocal distance and get lots of interesting discussions about it and if it's really effective and you know what blur circle size do you use when you're figuring it out and are depth of field tables correct now because they were established in the 1930s when we had different standards for papers and films and lenses and it's a fun discussion to have someday. 